All right, so the final presentation before we'll have some discussion time at the end is with from Kyle Nagy, and he's with the University of Idaho Sandpoint Agriculture, Organic Agriculture Center at, in Sandpoint, obviously. It's a, a newly acquired property for the University of Idaho, and perhaps you can give a little bit more introduction on that, but Kyle is the superintendent and orchard uh, operations manager there. Hello, everyone. All right, make sure I know how this thing works. So, uh, yeah, I'm up in uh, Sandpoint at the new uh, Sandpoint Organic Agriculture Center. Um, it was just established uh, in uh, August of last year, but uh, the orchard on site has been there since around 2008. Um, so here's a, a picture of what uh, the, the main building at the conference or at the uh, center is. Uh, it's got a lot of large meeting spaces and stuff in it. We're, we're starting to hold conferences up there and stuff. Uh, we're, uh, our master gardeners use that as, uh, as their um, facility, uh, with Jen Jensen being one of their uh, teachers down there. Um, and uh, we're, we're hoping to be able to get a lot more stuff uh, going up there. Uh, we're, we're working on a, a conference that's going to be about uh, heirloom apples, uh, which is uh, one of our focuses up there. Um, you can see a picture of the site here. Um, so it, it ends up being uh, a total of around 68 acres. Um, we have the established orchard uh, on the northern end of it. Uh, so the orchard is uh, approximately 640 trees right now, uh, and we're specializing in antique and heirloom varieties. So all these uh, trees, uh, we have 68 different varieties. So. It makes for a, a very interesting uh, season and harvest out there. Uh, and then you, this uh, top left photo is of uh, uh, Pink Sparkle, one of our favorite apples uh, that we grow up there. Um, and then you also see uh, top right is uh, one of our interns who just showed up over here, so uh, happy to have him. And he's actually going to be coming back uh, this uh, summer as well, so we're excited to get him back. Um, and uh, there's a picture of the orchard um, where we have approximately eight acres or so that's fenced in, uh, that the orchard's in, and that's all certified organic. And then um, the field around the orchard is approximately eight acres as well. Um, and uh, then there's approximately 12 more acres that we're gonna hopefully get certified organic here in the next few years. So there's a lot of space out there, so uh, we're, we're hoping to get uh, some people from the university uh, doing research up here, um, but we're also interested to find out uh, what, what organic growers in the state uh, really need more information on. So hopefully we can get some input from uh, growers that uh, really have a stake in, in this uh, new uh, center. So uh, I'm gonna talk about some of the pests that we have uh, up at the orchard. Um, and uh, being certified organic, we uh, do everything uh, within uh, the National Organic Program standards. So um, I'll talk about a few minor pests and then we'll get into some of the heavy hitters. So uh, for minor orchard pests, um, we, we see the pear slug, uh, this bottom left guy, uh, quite a bit in the spring. Um, the pear slug is actually a sawfly larva. Um, and it doesn't tend to do, uh, it, it, it seems to be pretty, uh, pretty uh, congested in the orchard. They're all in one area, it seems like. And uh, it's, uh, it's a, a task that uh, we usually let the interns take on because this uh, one is uh, easiest controlled in our situation by manually squeezing those little guys. So. Uh, I had one intern that didn't believe me the first time. I told him to go out and squeeze every pear slug in that tree. Um, another one we have are the uh, red humped caterpillars. Uh, this is another one that uh, it doesn't seem to pose an economic uh, problem for us, but uh, it's, it's really uh, something we're scouting for to make sure that uh, they're not too prevalent out in the orchard. Uh, once uh, the red hump caterpillars start uh, hatching, they'll feed uh, side by side and cover entire uh, twigs and, and limbs and uh, they can defoliate a, a five or six foot limb in, uh, in a day pretty easily. So it's, it's one we try to catch them uh, as soon as we uh, see any damage out there and, and get, them on, get on them as fast as we can. Uh, that's another one that uh, as long as they're 
Uh, pretty, pretty congregated within the orchard, that's another one that we just use good old mechanical control to get rid of these guys. Um, the earwigs are uh, one that doesn't pose a, a big threat on their own, um, but uh, they're ones that uh, can exasperate a problem. If, uh, if we have uh, anything that's been uh, bored into by a, a different uh, pest, the earwigs will get in there and, and make it significantly worse in a short amount of time. Um, something we use for the uh, earwigs is uh, they're looking for a, a kind of a, a dark place, so uh, sometimes we'll wrap uh, corrugated cardboard around the trunks of the trees and uh, they'll crawl up into there and hide in there and then we pull those off and get them out and, and burn them as, as quick as we can it's just so we don't get any more spreading from those guys. Um, so one of the big things that uh, we focus on for uh, organic pest control in the orchard is, is tracking degree days. Is, is, are people familiar with degree day tracking? So uh, what we're doing is uh, we're, we're kind of finding uh, the, the best time to uh, control these pests by uh, uh, evaluating the temperatures and it's, it depends on the pest or the disease we're dealing with but there's usually a uh, lower and upper threshold uh, and then with uh, this calculation here we uh, figure out how many degree days were, are per day and then we just that number keeps accumulating through the season and when we hit certain uh, points that's when uh, a pest is, uh, say, uh, ready to hatch or uh, it's ready to lay eggs. Uh, so we're able to time our sprays uh, to, to when they're really going to have an impact. Um, and this does result in, in fewer sprays for us, but it, it's, it's all about targeting them when they're most uh, susceptible. Um, another thing I'm going to talk a little bit about is uh, bud stages in, in the apples. Um, and this is uh, one of the ways we determine when to use sprays and that type of thing. Um, and uh, if there's tons of images of this online. So uh, just to familiarize yourself with uh, the different stages that the buds go through um, at the beginning of the growing season. So uh, apple aphids, um, they're one that we deal with uh, every year. Um, they don't tend to do any uh, harm to the fruit but they can definitely uh, cause some stunting in the trees. Um, the aphids are always looking for that uh, newest tender growth that they can really uh, sink their teeth into, so to say. Um, but uh, you'll, it's, it's an easy one to spot. You're gonna see your terminal ends, you're gonna see starting to curl, and, and, uh, and once you get up in there and see them, they're, they're, they can be thick in there. Um, one of the things that uh, we've started doing is uh, trying to take care of the ant problem uh, rather than just the aphids. Uh, the ants uh, can, can make an infestation uh, quite a bit worse because the ants actually uh, work with the aphids and will farm the aphids. Uh, they'll move them around on the tree if uh, they're starting to deplete the resources in one area. They'll uh, protect the aphids against uh, other predators that are trying to get rid of them. So uh, one thing that we've started to use for, uh, for the ants is uh, a product called Tanglefoot. And uh, what you do is uh, you, you wrap uh, some type of barrier around the uh, trunk pretty tightly. Uh, what I like to do is use uh, like orange flagging tape and uh, I'll wrap it around the trunk nice and tight um, for probably about three inches on the trunk and then I'll take a piece of electrical tape and make a loop around there to hold it in place really well. And then you take this product called Tanglefoot and you just paint it on there. So it doesn't come into contact with the bark or anything, but uh, it just prevents those, uh, the ants from going up and down the tree. Uh, because the, the ants, what they're doing is uh, they're actually milking the aphids. The aphids poop out this little drop of honeydew and that's what the ants are eating. So uh, that's what they're at. And it's, it's interesting because the, the ants will actually stroke the aphids with their antenna to, to milk them to produce this honeydew. So it's, it's a pretty interesting process. Um, but uh, by putting the tanglefoot on there, you can help them get up and down the tree. So that can definitely cut down on your ants and that definitely helps with your aphids as well. And it's so satisfying once you get it on there to see the first ant try crawling up that tree and get stuck and it's just like, it's working. 
Um, some other things we do are uh, we do a uh, dormant oil spray. Um, this is usually, um, or a delayed dormant oil. It's usually at around that half inch uh, green stage on the uh, apple buds is what we're looking for. Um, and this really helps to just coat everything and the eggs aren't able to respirate and, and uh, respire and yeah. Another thing uh, you can do just as a homeowner is uh, a high pressure water spray. You don't want to get out a pressure washer or anything, but uh, just by using hose pressure and a directed spray, you can spray your tips and knock out a lot of those aphids. And uh, it depends on uh, when you're seeing this infestation, but at certain points in the year, uh, the wingless um, aphids are much more uh, predominant than the winged aphids. So if you can knock those wingless aphids off of that tree and onto the ground, they're not going to make it back into the tips of that tree. Um, and then another thing we can do is uh, we can use uh, biocontrol, uh, the natural enemies of the aphids. Um, ladybugs and green lacewings are two of the uh, go-tos for us. Um, the green lacewings uh, tend not to stick around as well, uh, but we've had pretty good luck with the uh, ladybugs. Um, and uh, although the adult uh, ladybugs will do quite a bit of control, uh, we're really looking for uh, their, their larvae, the guys on the top right there, and uh, they're the real voracious feeders on these uh, aphids. Um. So uh, another one that we deal with, um, and this is for the cherries, is the uh, western cherry fruit fly. And uh, these can really do uh, a lot of damage uh, if it goes untreated. Um, although they only uh, go through one generation a year, they can do a, a tremendous amount of damage. Um, so the uh, adults tend to emerge in May, um, and they quickly become uh, sexually mature. And uh, as soon as they are, they're going to start uh, laying eggs uh, right under the skin of uh, the cherries. And uh, the act of laying the egg doesn't do a whole lot of damage, but uh, the real damage comes uh, after uh, a short period uh, when that egg actually hatches. And that depends on, on temperature and weather and everything. But uh, once the uh, eggs hatch into the larva, um, you, they'll start to burrow down towards the pit of the cherry and uh, they're actually uh, feeding on that flesh on the way in there and uh, they'll spend uh, 10 to 21 days depending on weather uh, inside that cherry before they uh, bore themselves a nice new hole and drop out um, and they'll drop to the ground, spin a little cocoon and uh, then they'll overwinter there in the soil. So uh, you can see the damage in the upper right. Um, nobody wants to bite into a cherry and look and see that in the other half. Um, but you might have got half of them already, so you're probably OK. Um, for, for control, um, we, we do some trapping um, to determine when we need to be doing, making our sprays. Um, you can use uh, yellow sticky traps, but they tend not to be extremely reliable uh, for, for when to uh, make your application. So what we're doing is tracking degree days. Um, and uh, this helps us uh, determine when uh, we need to really start uh, spraying for them. And uh, it might be a little different this year since uh, we still have uh, about 30 inches of snow out in the orchard on March 1st. Um, but uh, that's where we're just starting to track our temperatures, our highs and lows. And uh, that's how we can get to uh, tracking our degree days. Um, for the first spray, um, we're usually looking for around uh, 1,066 degree days after March 1st, um, but this can vary a little bit depending on the year. Um, another, if you're not tracking degree days, a safe bet to go is uh, with petal drop, and that's when uh, we're usually looking for our first spray. Um, and then uh, we're using a, a spinosad product, being certified organic, we're using uh, Intrust SC. Um, and uh, it doesn't uh, stick around quite as long as some of the conventional methods. So um, with the uh, spinosad on the cherries, we're spraying on a 7 to 14 day interval um, from petal drop uh, through harvest. So it's quite a few applications. Um, but uh, we're, it's also uh, worth considering doing some control after your harvest uh, just to bring down the amount of, uh, of uh, pupa you have in the soil uh, that are going to overwinter down there because there's uh, usually end up being some uh, cherries left in the orchard that don't get picked. 
Um, leaf rollers, um, another one that uh, we see quite a bit of damage from, and uh, the most obvious one we see is, uh, is when you have the leaf actually stuck to the surface of the apple. And uh, what they're doing is uh, they're just creating a nice sheltered space for, for them to go through their life cycle. Um, there's, a, there's a few different uh, species that we'll see in the orchard, but uh, the most prevalent are the uh, pandemis and the oblique banded leaf rollers. And uh, these are both uh, pests that can go through two life cycles or two generations in a, a single summer. Um, so they can really uh, do some damage. Um, so they're uh, overwintering in uh, crevices in the bark or uh, on the pruning scars that are still healing over. Um, and uh, the larvae start to become active right around uh, when you start to see bud break out in the orchard. Um, and as soon as that uh, flower or leaf bud starts to open up and just opens up a little bit, they're able to, to get into there and, and bore right into all that living tissue. And uh, they'll, they'll spend their, their time in that expanding tissue um, until they're, they're fully grown and ready to pupate uh, in, in mid-May. Um, uh, the adults then uh, emerge a few weeks later um, and uh, really go to work doing their damage. Uh, They'll, they'll go into your, your new growth and uh, spin webs uh, that actually uh, encase themselves. So uh, they're really tough to hit uh, with, with uh, any spray applications once they get to that point. So uh, what we're really looking to do is get them in the stage uh, when they're moving from their hatch into that, uh, that new, uh, the new open buds. So um, we can use some pheromone uh, traps, um, and that will give us a, a good idea of when uh, they're first getting active. Um, we, we look for uh, biofix in uh, degree day calendars, so uh, that's uh, when you get your first, uh, first catch of a moth in a uh, pheromone trap. And uh, what that really does is, is gives us an idea of when we need to start making some applications. Um, but uh, usually when we start to get to that uh, biofix point, we, we start our degree days calendar, and, uh, and then from that we can kind of determine when's the best time to make our applications. Um, but like I was saying, what we're really trying to do is catch these guys uh, before they're uh, fully grown to where they're spinning their webs and, and we're not able to get in there at them. So um, what we're looking to do for the, for the first generation is, is catching them at... Uh, when those buds are just starting to, to open up. So we're using a, a BT product, um, and uh, let's see, the, I can't think of what uh, the one we uh, use is called, but uh, we're trying to get uh, two to three applications of BT uh, between the tight cluster stage and uh, the, the petal drop phase. So um, if we can get those uh, controlled in that time, that's gonna really cut down on our next generation. And uh, then if we can use our degree day calendars and temperature tracking to uh, determine when that second generation is going to uh, be, be uh, hatching from their eggs and making their way into uh, the plant tissue, uh, that's, that's when we can kind of determine when to make our next uh, spray applications. And uh, the last one I'm going to talk about is uh, the coddling moth, and this is probably one of the biggest ones uh, that's uh, a pest in the orchard industry. And uh, they're, they're, they're a pain in the butt, that's for sure. Um, so uh, they're uh, an insect that's going to overwinter as a, a larva in the cocoon that's uh, overwintering under some loose bark. They're usually in their second or third instar before they, uh, uh, when they're uh, overwintering. Uh, when they do pupate, it's usually uh, right around when the, we hit the pink stage in the buds, when that flower is, is just uh, about to fully open and you see the pink uh, bulb at the end of your buds. And uh, that also kind of coincides uh, with their, the adults emerging right around the bloom of, uh, of Red Delicious. Um, so that's, that's one way to kind of determine what, what time you're looking at. Um, so. <clears throat> Peak emergence is usually uh, 17 to 20 days after your uh, orchard hits full bloom, um, and that's when uh, the adults uh, can, can mate and, and lay their eggs uh, within just a few days of, uh, of emerging. So uh, 
let's see, the, in, let's see, eight to, eight to 14 days, uh, they'll incubate uh, that first generation, and uh, the newly hatched larva uh, bore into the developing fruit buds, and uh, they spend some time in those fruit buds uh, before they uh, also are, are leaving and uh, spinning a cocoon, and uh, then they overwinter again in the bark or uh, will drop to the soil and to the leaf litter and overwinter there. Um, they, you'll, you'll see damage uh, when they're boring into the fruit. Uh, the small fruits, you'll see uh, holes in through the sides or up through the calyx end of the apple, and uh, you'll see that that board hole is, is usually filled with frass or, or uh, caterpillar poop for the most part, or larva poop. But uh, they'll, they'll push that out and then uh, eventually they'll either bore a new hole to drop out or they'll uh, drop back out out of that hole. Um, so this is, this is one that uh, we're, we're really paying attention to because it can uh, really do a, a lot of damage to a, an apple harvest. Um, we do get our pheromone traps up um, and we, we try to get them in there uh, by, uh, by that pink stage so that as those adults are merging, we're, we're getting some of the, the first ones out there. Um, but uh, with, with BioFix with the coddling moss, we're, we're not looking for just the first moth to get in there. We're looking for our first consistent catch. So we're looking for um, two to three moths uh, in a single trap in one night, or we're looking for um, traps throughout the orchard that are all catching a single moth in a night. So that's when we know they're, they're really getting active. Uh, sometimes we'll catch one or two and then we'll get a cold spell and we won't catch any for a few days. Um, and then if, if that's the case, then we would, we would start our count over uh, when we start to catch them again. Uh, and that gives you a, a better idea of when they're actually going to be out there. Um, one of the uh, best uh, things we can do as uh, organic uh, orchardists is uh, use mating disruption. And uh, what that is, is uh, the, uh, the, f the males are, are using uh, pheromones to locate uh, the females. And uh, by, by taking that female pheromone and, and putting it out in the orchard in, uh, in pretty, pretty heavy levels, um, we confuse those males. Um, so out of the 640-ish trees we have in the orchard, we're usually putting uh, these, uh, these mating disruptors in around 400 trees. So it's, it's a, a large number of the trees, and that's just to, to confuse them so they're not able to, to find the mate and, and lay their eggs. So you end up with a lot of uh, sexually frustrated male moths out in the orchard. Um, and then uh, what we're going to do um, if uh, when we get into the season and, uh, and we're still having any problems, we'll, we'll start spraying a spinosad product as well, and that's uh, that Entrust SC. Um, and uh, in the, the coddling moths, you can see from uh, the, the history chart there, um, they're, they're prevalent, uh, the adults are prevalent throughout most of the, the growing season, so they can really cause a, a lot of trouble if, uh, if they're not controlled. Um, and this is just uh, s a little more exact information on what, uh, what some of our thresholds or wh where we're looking for our degree days uh, for these different, uh, different pests. Um, I've included apple scab in there because that's another, uh, it's a disease rather than a, an insect pest, but that's definitely uh, one that we're always thinking of out in the orchard. Um, and different uh, pests and disease are going to have different, uh, different degree day models. So. Um, so the western cherry fruit fly has a base temperature of, of 41, but it doesn't have an upper threshold uh, where the leaf rollers have a low of 41 and uh, a high of 85. So it's, it's going to be a little bit different from each pest, but there's a lot of good resources out there um, to, to get that information from. Um, apple scab is, is one that we're really paying attention to out in the orchard. And that's one that we start uh, recording degree days at the uh, first uh, green tips that we see out in the orchard, where uh, a lot of these uh, we start uh, tracking degree days uh, by a calendar date, like the uh, western cherry fruit fly we just started recording uh, temperatures for yesterday. Um, and, uh, and we'll continue to, to track those until we, we're getting close to that, uh, that first uh, flight threshold that we're looking at. Um, and I think that's really all I had. Um, 
you guys have any questions, we can do that, or uh, some other good resources. Uh, WSU has tons of good uh, fruit tree uh, resources. And then uh, there's a, a great book called uh, Organic Fruit Tree Management that's actually out of uh, British Columbia's uh, orchard growers. Questions? Um, you mean the, well, the mites, for example, have been found on bumblebees, but they only reproduce in, in the brood cells of apis. So what happens, at least with varroa mite, is sometimes they'll be on a flower, they'll get on a bee, but it's a dead end. So they've never been found as reproducing or associated, you know, with, um, with anything other than the genus Apis, the, our honeybee. But the, now the viruses, it's interesting, they're, they're trying to get away from, so for example, you can f detect a virus, say, in a honeybee, and then you name it a honeybee virus, but it doesn't mean it came from there. So many of these viruses uh, have been found in uh, wasps and, and other bees, but we don't know the source of them. It's just that people are looking really hard you know, at honeybees. So, they're trying to get a little bit away from uh, describing viruses as, say, you know, a honeybee virus, because that same virus may be found in, you know, a ground nesting bee or something else. So, uh, so yes to viruses. Yes, viruses have been found. The, um, the, some of those fungal diseases, like chalk brood, that, that was well known from honeybees. It's now a big problem in alfalfa leaf cutting bees. It's why in the US we buy alfalfa leaf cutting bees uh, cells every year from Canada. It used to be kind of a self sustaining thing in the US where you could, um, you, do you know about alfalfa leaf cutter bees? They use them for alfalfa seed production a lot in Washington State and Idaho. And these, uh, uh, they, you, they nest in little uh, straws or in little wooden blocks that, that have chambers. And uh, they, they cut the leaf, they, they make a little uh, cell, they, they collect pollen, the individual female does, collects pollen, lays an egg on it, and she'll make you know, seven or eight of those offspring in one tube. And now, or, or some years ago, people began finding chalk brood, which they only knew previously from the honeybee, in that, and so, uh, so yeah, a number of these like fungal diseases and viral diseases can go across species, but we don't know necessarily where they originated from, you know, in some cases. Well, I mean, well, first of all, alfalfa leaf cutter bees aren't actually native either. They're from, uh, they were found in 1948 around Washington D.C. as an accidental, accidental introduction. They're from. Eurasia, but uh, yeah, they are uh, certainly the uh, like uh, chalk brood. In other countries, they call it Ascofairy disease because uh, Ascofera is a genus of that fungus. But um, yeah, that's definitely harmful to uh, some of these other bees. Yeah, but um, you know, it's just assigning the origin to them is sometimes a problem. And viruses are found all over the place. Uh, and, um, you know, again, we don't know where, where they originate from, and there really isn't much of a treatment. 
that I didn't talk about it, but the, these fungal extracts that we've been now experimenting with and feeding to honeybees actually do reduce virus levels. So now we're kind of working on whether it improves colony health at the same time, or does it just reduce viruses? Because you know, you know, we use DNA methods to amplify the viruses and determine whether they had it or not, but you can't, there's no real obvious uh, visual identification of whether they have the virus. You can just test for it. Um, so, uh, being certified organic, they've really gotten rid of a lot of the controls we can use for fire blight. Most of them were antibiotics, um, and our, our first go-to is, is get rid of it as soon as you can, cut it out, and we're usually, depending on the type of infection or how bad it is, we'll cut uh, a foot below the infection that we see and get it out of there and burn it as fast as we can. Uh, we haven't seen a whole lot. I think we've only seen it twice in uh, the last uh, eight years or so at the orchard. So uh, it's something that we that we're definitely always on the on the on the lookout for, um, and just try to get rid of it as quick as we can. Yeah, and, and that's like with this year, I, I don't think we're going to be positive for a while looking at the forecast up in Sandpoint. But yeah, yep, that's usually what we're looking at. So uh, right now we're we're just selling around Sandpoint. Where our production is still pretty low. Uh, the oldest trees are around eight years old, and we have uh, a block that was just planted two years ago, and a block of of around 250 that uh, last year was actually the first year that we harvested off of them. But we're selling at uh, Yokes and Winter Ridge and Sandpoint, and uh, then we also press cider uh, in the fall and into the winter and uh, get that out there as well. And it's the best cider around. <laughs> yeah, yep. Uh, so we also uh, do some donations to uh, the Bonner County Food Bank up in Sandpoint. Uh, we also grow raspberries up there. So uh, we're, we usually get quite a few volunteers from the food bank to come out and, and pick with us out there. So trying to get, get that fruit out to people for sure. At, at this point, we haven't started doing that yet, and, and like I was saying, uh, the orchard's been around uh, for, for almost 10 years now, uh, but we've just became part of the university back in August of this year, or of last year, so I'm, I'm hoping we're going to be able to do more stuff like that in the future, but I have been trying to track as much information about the individual varieties as I can over the last few years, and uh, we're working on putting a website together um, that'll be through UI. and. Uh, it'll have information on all of our varieties and, and stuff we've learned about them over the years. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Yeah, we're actually working with uh, a guy named David Ben Scotter uh, that's over in uh, eastern Washington, and uh, he's uh, identified, I think it's around 180 varieties that were historically uh, grown and sold in uh, North Idaho and eastern Washington. And he's actually going out to all these old homesteads and trying to identify these varieties on these neglected homesteads. And he's actually found some varieties that uh, we had thought were extinct just because they, they grew out of favor. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of options. And if we're going to try and possibly recreate uh, a nursery from uh, that would have historically been available, uh, we could be adding a whole lot more varieties here in the future. But yeah, we're, we're hoping to be able to get that stuff out to, to the public in the future as well. Uh, 
David Benscotter. Uh, I, I think he's uh, the Orchard Project. Are you guys known for our hand weed interviews? Making interns weed. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, we, we do a little bit of uh, hand weeding right around the base of the trees. Um, but uh, we also use some mulching in there to try and keep those weeds down. But uh, for the most part, uh, we, we don't have a whole lot of uh, significant weed pressure, but uh, we, we try and control them uh, by, by spot pulling uh, when we see something we really don't want in there. It's, it's, it's a, a big, big commitment for sure. Yeah, so um, a lot of the growers that we work with do have at least a small area of their land set aside in conservation that they are growing wildflowers in. Um, typically, those tend to be the parts of the farms that they can't farm, like slopes are too severe, stuff like that. Um, but we do have quite a few growers that are doing that. Um, as of right now, I haven't looked into what impact that has, um, but I have a bunch of the data. I just haven't analyzed it yet. So um, one of the uh, other students in my lab who actually just graduated, defended his PhD yesterday, um, has done a lot of work with conservation strips and floral planting on farms um, in smaller farms in western Washington. And he's found that um, increasing the sort of floral diversity on a farm and maintaining that floral diversity over years um, does have a benefit toward um, increasing bee populations. Um, but that just doing it like for one year doesn't really necessarily have an impact. So as, if you do decide that you want to plant to increase pollinators, um, try to plant long-term plants like flowering shrubs that can stay on your space for a number of years if you want to if you want to increase and promote pollinator habitat. So the question was, have I looked into the sort of non-cultivated parts of the soil um, that might provide habitat? Uh, and I have, I'm working on it, but again, it's, it's all work that I haven't finished processing yet. G GIS and I have um, a tumultuous relationship. <laughs> So the question is, do the sites that I work on have honeybees at the farm? Some of them do and some of them don't, um, but typically the honeybees are coming onto the farm a little bit later than when I'm visiting. Um, and so I'm seeing honeybees on the farm and I'm not necessarily sure. I think of the nine farms that I sampled last year, two had colonies on the farm on the day that I sampled. Um, but I found honeybees at all but one farm. So they're around. Was there a difference at all if they were specifically on that farm? Um, no, not significantly. Because I, I did, if I knew that there were bees on the farm, I tried to sample further away from the honeybee hives. Um, a lot of these farms are huge, you know, several thousand acres in some cases. And so I tried to get far away enough from where the hives were, being lo were located that I wouldn't have that increased sampling bias as much as possible that I could control for it. But if a neighbor had honey beehives that I didn't know about, um, you know, I, I can't really control for that. Do you think that may have affected some of the other native bees, their populations? It's hard to tell from the data. Um, I know I have read studies in the past that have shown honey bee pressure um, may displace other wild bees. Um, but in this system, I, I think that the canola um, resource is so abundant that it really can potentially provide for 
all of the bees that are there um, for the period of time. Um, but again, it didn't look like there was no significant difference in terms of um, number of bees even when I was sampling where there were bees. No, no, that's a really good question. So I, I should, uh, in full disclosure, we've actually been breeding honeybees, and actually it started with a, a really large grant in about 2000. So for about 20 years, we've been selecting for a strain we call the WSU program bees. And those are just bees that we've selected, you know, for honey production, gentleness. We, you know, we don't use antibiotics for foul brood. So disease resistance, there's some genetics involved in that. And, and so that's just a line of bees kind of adapted for the Pacific Northwest. Uh, these other subspecies, my original idea was that, um, that queen producers would be really, really happy that we brought in, you know, the additional genetic diversity for them to breed from. And that was a big mistake. So we, we brought this stuff in, we gave it to them, and they said, oh, well, they're not, for the Italian bees, they're not yellow enough. Because, you know, Americans have this, at least with Italian bees, have this idea that they should be bright yellow. You go to Italy, where they have the bee, and they're kind of brownish yellow. You know, they're not, the bees in the U.S. are much more yellow, the Italians, than the bees in Italy are. So they, the, the, the users, like the queen producers, wanted really yellow bees, and they wanted bees that behaved kind of like the ones that their father and grandfather selected. So we kind of realized that just bringing in new genetics and handing them over to uh, queen producers, they're great queen producers, but they're not really very sophisticated, I, don't, I hate to say that, but they're not very interested or very able to deal with breeding. Because, you know, they're, right now, because of the, the, the bee industry, as they say, you can kind of sell any queen with six legs. So, uh, you know, every queen that you make as a queen producer, you can sell it. And so for them to, to maybe reduce their production, to spend more time, to care about, you know, selective breeding, they don't do it. So after a couple of little starts and feedback from the queen producers, we, uh, we get the material and we take it through some of our own selection before we give that to them. Uh, that picture that I showed of the two, que the two queen producers that drove up, they were getting um, Italian honeybee stock, which we're not that interested in here because they're not very adapted to these conditions. You know, the, they're much more, they're much better for a Mediterranean type climate like California or so, southern U.S. And, uh, and so what we've done is a couple of the trips, we've actually taken queen producers with us to Italy, who then went around and saw the bees, saw how good they were, you know, I mean, gentle, the very productive, those, the traits set that, that if you weren't really caring about the color that you might think were important. And, and so I, there's, there's, you know, there's a bit of a change uh, coming, and, and what's happened, because we've gone around and talked about this stuff for the last seven or eight years, there's kind of a little bit of a demand for these Caucasian honeybees. What these, we, my grandfather had those, I remember those. So now the queen producers are getting the breeder queens from us because there's a little bit of a demand from the buyers, you know. So uh, it's, it's kind of weird how things happen. So one of the reasons the Caucasian honeybee fell out of favor was because they produce a lot of propolis. So the bees collect this tree resin propolis and they line the inside of their cavity with it. And we now know 
that it's pretty important. It, it helps boost their immune uh, abilities for the colony. So honeybees genetically don't have a lot of genes that code for immune, uh, immune response. But as a, as a social entity, they can do things like they can raise the temperature of the hive when they get an infection. And you know, rather than the individual bee doesn't have the immune response, but they have a social response. So we now know that propolis, which beekeepers hated because it glues everything together, so that's why they didn't like Caucasian honeybees. Now that now propolis is good, so now there's more demand for for you know bees that use more propolis. So it's kind of a a weird thing of the marketing and, and, and all that. So. I try not to tell people that genetic diversity by itself means that these bees are any better, you know, because uh, there have been a lot of cases where the USDA has brought in, say, a particular honeybee and the expectations are really high that this was going to solve all of everyone's problems, and it didn't. So, uh, so, tr so I guess what I'm saying is, is the queen producers, some of them are now really getting on board with the idea of buying for, for what would seem like very expensive queens. We sell those instrumentally inseminated breeder queens for $1,000 each. You're paying $1,000 for an insect. But, you know, they can make uh, $20,000 from that queen when, by making queens and selling them. So for them, it's no big deal to pay to get five breeder queens, pay us five thousand dollars, and then they're going to make you know a half million on it. So, so they're not willing to throw out the, their own stock or what their grandpa had, but they're beginning to incorporate this into what they're doing. So, that's that one. Well, no, that's a really, that's an excellent question. So in the U.S., there was a very extensive wild population, a feral population of honeybees, especially in the east. I have samples of about 700 wild colonies that during my Ph.D. and after that we collected, and we looked genetically at them using genetic markers, and they had evidence of a number of these subspecies that were brought in. About a third of them had the mitochondrial DNA of that black bee of northern Europe that no one's kept for, you know, 100 years. So it itself was a huge genetic resource, but then when the Varroa mite came, it almost, not completely, but it wiped out a lot of that feral population. And over here in the West, there really has never been much of a feral population, I think because of the, the different agriculture or the different sort of a, uh, plants, you know, that that eastern deciduous forest w filled up really quickly with, with honeybees, and uh, I, you know, I I I visited, you know, an 80 year old blind beekeeper in Tennessee when I was in graduate school, and he was, uh, he said he never could see very good, but when he was about 20, he went blind, but he was a beekeeper, and he remembered when people brought those yellow bees to the mountains, which would have been Italians. But after a few years, they just turn black like all the other bees. So you know, these, you, know, you have a huge feral population. You bring something in there, and then it kind of dilutes it out to what they had. So it, it was a cool resource. The question now is how much of it is left, the feral population. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to say something about that, but I have a question too, and it was already asked, which is, I think it would be great to know more about organic methods of weed control. I mean, that's, that is a big problem. Um, you know, one thing, it, it really will depend on the species, because some of these uh, solitary bees have amazingly tight 
connection to their, the plant that they feed on. So in Illinois, there's spring beauty, this little tiny flower. There's a halicta that comes out that's only on that uh, flower. Bees, that, honeybees pretty much ignore it because there's not much food there, but they, they come out and they're, they're collecting their pollen and nectar for their whole life cycle for the next year just when that one flower is out. So it would kind of depend when you brought the honeybees there. If you brought them when there's a huge canola field, they're going to be you know, all over that canola, or they're going to be over things that, you're, that are blooming right then. But, but for the most part, a lot of the solitaire bees are going to have more discrete periods of the year where they're kind of vulnerable, let's say, to competition for their uh, their crop and honeybees have always been called by people that work on solitary bees pollen pigs because they you know they'll go out and they'll feed on anything but once it gets a little bit tough they abandon it and go to something else whereas the solitary bees are usually much more efficient at getting nectar and pollen from their specific co-evolved uh, partner species you know so they can oftentimes not be affected by honeybees because honeybees are only taking kind of the, the extra bonus time wonderful, wonderfulness out of the flower and then the, the actual ones that are co-evolved with it um, are able to still survive on what's left. But it would depend on the species. Yeah, that w when they're, I'll tell you, when you're, so you're, that's a very good question because the amount of hives that you can put in one location depends on the forage for the bees. And so if you're in a really, really good place, you might put 40 hives or maybe even 50 in one location. But that would be kind of unusual. So 36 is a lot. They're not at all caring about your two and a half acres for food for their bees. That, you know, the bees have a flight range of, uh, you know, a half mile or a mile. So, so all the acreage within there is what they're counting on. So we don't, we would never, or not never, but we seldom put more than about 20 or 24 hives in a single location here in, around here anywhere because there's just not that much uh, food for them. Unless we're putting them on canola. Sometimes they do this thing where they put a huge number of colonies on a small area. Can you guess for what? Can you guess when you would do that? Um, yeah, no, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know about your particular case. It's usually when the crop is very, very valuable. So like these, some of these vegetable seed producers on the west side, they'll put five hives per acre on them because the, an acre of the seed they get is so valuable that you know, they don't want to take any chance of not getting pollination. But it's not good for the bees. I mean, you know, the bees don't have enough food when you put a whole bunch of bees there, but in that case, the beekeeper is being paid to kind of let his bees be harmed a little bit because they're getting the pollination fee. Uh huh. So what's around you for the for his bees or her? forest? There you go. Yeah, yeah. Depends. Yeah, go ahead. Where are you located? I'm in Spokane County. Okay. How? Okay. Do you work with your extension agents? Yes, ish. Yes, ish. So, uh, yes, go ahead. So, at its heart, that's what extension is for. They're the sort of middle point between growers and researchers where they're communicating back and forth between the folks who are doing 
the research and the growers who want the research done and kind of using that to inform. Um, and Extension also does a lot of their own research. Um, since you're relatively close, um, if you aren't feeling like the person in your county is necessarily interested in the questions that you're asking, reach out to WSU Extension home base. Um, there are over a dozen different researchers in um, just in you know crops and flowers and um, and so I think that if you really tap into that extension resource, um, I think so. I grew up on the west side and I my background is also in farming and so that's kind of how I got into the research that I'm doing was through an internship with extension um, and I think on this side of the state and in northern Idaho, because the majority of our agriculture is very large scale, single crop a lot of times, um, a lot of the extension that um, is kind of being most well advertised is the wheat extension, the pea extension, the, the canola extension to an extent. Um, and so I think that the smaller flower farmers and the smaller fruit and vegetable farmers don't necessarily realize that there is still a huge amount of valuable resource available to you um, through your county extension or through WSU extension. And, um, and if you reach out to those folks, they're, they're really happy and, and genuinely passionate to help. Yeah, and if I say one other thing, uh, Xerxes Society and also uh, UC Davis Extension, uh, who's uh, Neil? Uh, Neil Williams. Neil Williams has been doing a huge amount of work on plantings. He's really a solitary kind of bee person, but usually the things that you plant for solitary bees are actually good for honeybees as well. Okay. I mean, it, yeah, Claire Crimmin. If you think about uh, around here, or, or the, say the Palouse, the big problem for bees, it's, to some extent, is July and August. You know, everything kind of dries up. So uh, the spring's okay. It's an okay place to. This isn't a very good place for honeybees, by the way, but it's a great place for breeding bees because there's not a lot of competing beekeepers all over the place. You know, like if you're down in California, you know, there's a million colonies down there right now. But um, yeah, uh, I think. There are some people working on the very questions you're asking, and and I think the Xerxes Society and or Neil or the there's this Pheasants Forever group actually that uh, has come up with the regional seed mixes that that provide for uh, blooming nectar and pollen resources for pollinators throughout the whole season. So if you could plant things in a way that you nectar available throughout the summer, that would really give a boost to uh, pollinators. 